of the um, of the pension fund, and um, it's a it's a pleasure to have you with us, George. Thank and you. The lots of work. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice the nice meeting is well attended. It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's uh, nice to you all here. Uh, I know that some people don't know each other, so I'm going to ask us all to introduce ourselves. Actually, there are some people you don't know, George, perhaps. So perhaps we'll start off with Adrian. Uh, do, do you mind just brief introductions? Yes, I do. Councilor Adrian Jones, Woodall of Council. Paul Higgins, representing the retired members of the Pension Fund. John Spence, Woodall of Council, Nice Guy Payton, Operations Manager, Bayside Pension Fund. Yvonne Haddock, Principal Pensions Officer, Bayside Pension Fund. Joe Blast, Chief Director, Woodall Council. Peter Warlock, Head of Pension Fund. Act requires each 
Local Government Pension Fund to set up a pensions board. The final regulations are expected to be laid in January this month, uh, but we've yet to see those. And the uh, board has to be in place by the 1st of April. Uh, under 2.4, we uh, note that the board isn't a committee uh, set up under the Local Government Tax. Uh, there is a specific creation of the general public sector pension legislation and therefore requirements such as political guidance do not apply. The board is not a decision-making body, but its role is to assist the administering authority, which is also known as a scheme manager, with the pensions committee retaining responsibility for decisions in respect of the management of investments and administration. There are restrictions. Uh, on both uh, council members and officers that one shouldn't serve on both committee and the pensions board. Under section 2.7 we set out the roles of the various governance bodies and as we say under section 2.8 there will be an ongoing uh, exchange of information between the board and pensions committee and also between the section 151 of the administering authority uh, with board and risk management committee also involved if necessary. Under section 2.9 we set out the proposed composition of the pensions board. It's suggested that there is an independent member to chair the board and then there are four employer and four employee representatives. The appointment process is set out under 2.9 Section 2.12. If I pause at this moment, uh, under 2.13, um, in our recommendations, we suggest that appointment is both for a period of four years and a period of six years uh, to enable continuity of experience and knowledge uh, on the pensions board at initial appointment. Under 2.16, um, we suggest remuneration for board members, which is based on what was previously called the uh, Special Responsibility Allowance for uh, the Chair of the Pensions Committee, uh, which means that the proposal would be that the Chair of the Pensions Board will be paid £2,751 per annum and other members £1,375.50. Uh, this would cover the attendance at two meetings, uh, additional training, and the uh, statutory requirement for uh, knowledge and, and, and understanding, which goes with the, the pension board membership. Uh, we then cover terms of reference under 2.12, and these are set out in more detail in Appendix 1. And then we conclude with the timetable under 2.23. Uh, members will notice that time is quite constrained, which is why we brought these additional recommendations to Pensions Committee uh, to enable the establishment of the, the board uh, within the timeline set out by government. Um, so section uh, 8 indicates that any costs incurred in the establishment and the ongoing running of the Pensions Board are chargeable to the Pension Fund. The legal, legal implications are that there will be the requirement of full council, uh, approval by full council, and an amendment uh, both to Rural's constitution and to the fund's governance policy. Uh, as I say, recommendations under section 13 have been expanded in the additional paper that we have brought. Uh, those are mainly uh, minor changes to the report. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, can we just re-emphasise the fact that uh, we are awaiting um, confirmation of details and information from the uh, central government, uh, which we have not received as yet, uh, which may alter uh, the, the final um, report that goes to council. Um, there is a very tight um, uh, timetable that we need to adhere to. Um, so, hence, we have some recommendations uh, in front of us that, on reflection, uh, have been uh, presented to us uh, this evening. Uh, we do make the assumption that people have read um, the report, but I'm aware of the fact that some members have not seen uh, 
this additional sheet that's been passed to you. Uh, so perhaps if we give you a moment to read and reflect on that, and then if any of the members would like to ask questions of Peter as he's uh, suggested. Could we have a copy of the additional sheet as well, please?
The actual ad tab will be, will be reported to this committee in June. 2.3 refers to the fund's major expenditure and investment management fees. The ad tab 14, 15 and the budget 15, 16 all lower due to the market volatility and efficiencies gained from renegotiated fees. 2.4 refers to the second highest expenditure of staffing and informs members that the budget 1516 is largely unchanged and that the previously agreed 100,000 has been carried forward into 1516 and explains that further reports will follow if and when these resources are utilised. 2.5 highlights some issues around the coding and classification and these will be resolved before the report in June. The budget for 15-16 includes the costs of training of pension boards to ensure that knowledge and skills are sufficient, although any other expenditure on pension boards will be brought to the committee in June for approval. The departmental and central support charges for 15-16 are the same for the previous year, as we've not had any updated estimates. Section 3 of the report informs members that the fund has recently reviewed its risk register, identifying key risks and mitigating controls the key feature of the controls is having appropriate resources available to administer the fund adequately and manage investments. This budget provides adequate resources for these two core functions. 8.1 of this report informs members that the costs of the pension fund are charged directly to the pension fund and are then ultimately covered by investment income, employee and employee contributions. The full costs are estimated to be £135.61 per member. Section 13 of this report are the recommendation, recommendations. 13.1 asks members to approve the budget for 1516, and 13.2 recommends that a further report is brought to this committee in June 2015 with the actual outturn for 1415, along with the finalised estimates for salary overheads, default angle and central support charges and any further identified expenditure for pension boards. The approval of this budget for MPF by this committee forms part of the government's arrangements for the Merseyside Pension Fund. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Sure, if there are no questions, I'd just like to move the recommendations and our uh, congratulations to the, uh, the staff for another, another excellent performance.
currently we have six um, IMWPs over the year. Two of them we allocate uh, about an hour of often towards training. So that's why we highlight them in this particular report. But I will say that there are of uh, IMWPs and governments and this working parties to, uh, to the new members in particular. Okay, so we've got no more questions on that agenda item. Uh, we'll move on to the Treasury uh, Management Policy, which is agenda number <coughs> six. And again, that's if you saw it on. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The purpose of this report is to request members approve the Treasury Management Policy and Treasury Management Practices for the Merseyside Pension Fund for the year 2015-16. The policy statement is attached as an appendix to this report. Section 2 of the report outlines the background and the key issues. The CIPTA Code of Practice for Treasury Management and Public Services requires Pensions Committee to receive an annual report on the strategy to be pursued in the coming year. The last policy was approved at this committee in January 2014. Section 2.2 reminds members that the fund's cash flow from dealing with members has moved negative with payments to pensioners exceeding income and contributions and whilst investment income is direct, directly reinvested, the levels of public resources held need to be adequate and daily cash flows and regular reporting is essential. 2.4 summarises that NPF will comply with the 12 Treasury Management Practices detailed in sections 4 to 15 in the appendix and explained further in schedules 1 to 10 also within the appendix. The fund will run with minimum cash balances the main aims were managing liquid resources are the security of the capital, the liquidity of investments, and the matching of inflows from lending to predicted outflows. The achievement of high returns is of secondary importance to NPF compared with the security and liquidity of the asset. Council parties are reviewed on a regular basis using a range of information detailed within the report. Section 3 informs members that the Treasury Management Policy is concerned mainly with the mitigation of risks. The recommendation is within section 13 of the report and is that members approve the Treasury Management Policy and Treasury Management Practices for NPF for 2015-16. Approval of this policy forms part of the government's arrangements for Merseyside Pension Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Any questions? Just a straightforward one, uh, Chair, which is to um, establish that if there are any uh, variances between this year's policy and last year. No, On that basis, are we happy to, uh, to, to, to note the, the, the report and its recommendations?
attendance and representation. Thank you, Chair. It, it is open to uh, all members who would like to attend, so uh, if members would like to make their wishes known. resolution doesn't cover the last agenda item which is any other business so do you want us to go out and then be called back in or have you not got any items available and we can go ahead on? Saved us waiting around. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for attendance. 